Okay? So, a precautionary attitude would lead, of course, to stopping research and deprive future generations of knowledge that may be very useful to them. Our descendants will continue to evolve intellectually, culturally, materially. They may, with hindsight, adopt point of views quite different from ours. To stop the machine, the research, would deprive them of the possibility of further development and would prevent them from succeeding where we failed. This is our responsibility. We have no right to force them, our descendants, into a situation we, have to, we cannot hand down judgments in their place. They may be wiser than we are. The other question is also, when you think about risks and when you think about research and progress, people, somebody will have at some stage to decide what to do. Scientists, of course, have a responsibility to make progress in knowledge. The use of this knowledge, what you make of it, that's something society has to decide. Who could then, who are the people, who are those people in the society who should decide about it? Obviously, those who know, the competent ones. I know this is, doesn't sound very democratic, but you accept very well when you go to the physician, what the physician tells you. You could say, oh, come on, why do you tell me to do that? I am as equal, I'm equal to you. <coughs> yes, but the physician knows. So I think people who are competent should make the decisions. That is why we have parliamentary um, stru political structure. For me, the parliament is the, way, the best way to operate because we, all of us, don't know, have no time. It's not our job. So we elect people who, in principle, should do the work to be able to take decisions which are acceptable. When you take an airplane, do you want to vote for the pilot, or do you want the pilot to have the good training? No question about democracy. It's absolutely not democratic to sit in a plane. That guy in front, he does with you what he wants, or she wants. So you don't want to vote. You want to have a competent person who handles the thing, and that's the way it works. So we need competent people, but of course, these competent people have to have the confidence, they have to be reliable, so competence, confidence, and reliability are the requirements for proper functioning of our democracies. A crucial question concerns the developing countries. The gap between the developed and developing countries, will it get wider, wider and wider? <coughs> This north, what is called the north-south imbalance, will this continue to be like this? It is in unacceptable. Maybe it is not totally utopic to hope that accumulated knowledge and wealth and the very efficient advanced technologies which result from the research done in the developed countries might also provide means for the rapid progress of the less advanced ones by helping them to jump over intermediate stages of development, such as those of uh, heavy industry and the industrial age, directly into high-tech era. And this is a case where one could then hope to transfer directly high, highly advanced technologies which are much more economical and much less demanding in raw materials, resources, and energy. Such a direct entry into an era of soft, human-friendly, and environmentally conscious technologies would amount to what you might call a development shunt, a shunt where you jump over other things. And um, this can be very well illustrated, for instance, by communication. A country 
that has an unsatisfactory telephone system. We not have to lay more wires, more copper lines, these wires all over the place, which we have in France, which we have in many countries. But you can go directly to cellular phones. No wires, no need for copper. Cellular phones, small little pieces. Like in this desert, that's the way to do it. You don't want to put wires and lines and so on, but anybody in even this type of surroundings will be able, for instance, to get in touch with a physician somewhere and tell the person, look, this and this and these are the symptoms, what do I do? Because you still need the compound, the product, but contact can be established and this is my hope, at least, you know, sort of a optimistic way of looking at things, I must, uh, I must admit, but the fact that the very advanced technologies which have been developed in certain regions of the world, probably because it was not possible to develop at the same speed everywhere, but those who have been able to develop have now a responsibility to make it available to the others. And I would say that, for instance, giving free access to mobile phone to all the regions in the world which cannot afford it is a fantastic contribution we can make to having a closer friendship with the other people around the world. Science education in our schools, in our colleges, universities, as well as for the general public, must be a major priority so as to train the researchers and the discoverers of tomorrow to lift irrational fears and rejections to develop the scientific spirit, the scientific attitude, in order to fight the obscure, the deceitful, and the irrational. Beyond the general progress of knowledge and technological development, the most important impact science can and must have on society is the spirit it implies, the scientific, rational approaches towards the world, life, and society. Education, science, and technology may collide with tradition and herd beliefs or social structure. We must prepare for that. We must be prepared for that and take it into account so as to overcome it. The installation, for instance, of a solar-powered water pump accessible to everybody in a village, and this has happened as a real case, in a developing country, may destroy a traditional structure where power was in the hands of those who controlled the water supply. You give a pump to everybody, and the people who had the power because they were controlling the, the well have no power anymore. That's a great shock, and this may lead to disruption, but that's the way nevertheless to go. Not to speak, for instance, also about fertility control, which now, thanks to chemicals, can be done, to which some circles where fundamentalists from all sides are hand in hand manifest strong opposition. Science offers new freedoms, but mankind has to learn to live with them. Helping to bring science to everybody is the responsibility of the media also. In its present play state, they play at best a minimal role often a deplorable one. Major improvements must be brought about by a broad public, and the broad public would certainly be much more interested in high-quality science programs than many media bodies would like to believe. Many media bodies think people are stupid. People are not stupid. They want to learn. They have just to be able to present it, so they should do it. They must do it. There is here an extraordinary contribution that media can make at the interface of science and society. In the future, the information and communication networks will have a very dramatic, they already have, but even more so, dramatic influence on the way in which knowledge is disseminated and transmitted. Humanity has done it, it had transferred knowledge and culture through